Welcome to NPTEL, the national program on technology enhanced learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, our course is entitled English Language and Literature and we have already been through a couple of lectures. This module as you know is introductory in nature, we shall be talking about um, or we have already talked about say the scope of um, what this course uh, entails. We have uh, had an introductory lecture also to that effect and in the same vein uh, today's lecture is entitled the globalization of English. Now, as always let us do a recap of what we did in our last lecture. The last lecture as you would recall was about the alchemy of English and the, that lecture was largely based on the work of one person um, namely Braj, Professor Braj Kachru. And I had mentioned in that lecture that uh, you know um, the globalization of English or rather the alchemy of English okay, um, is a topic that has not uh, been dealt with only with Professor Kachru. There are several others who have pointed to the magic of English. Okay. Um, as we also know there are those who have critiqued the idea of the magic of English. Well, let us do a brief recap of what we saw in our last lecture. Now, let us look at this slide. Okay. In the last lecture, we found that whenever we speak of the power of English, right, there are important markers to that effect. Okay. Uh, for English, it is uh, for instance, sorry, for instance, it is not uh, said casually uh, that English has tremendous power and we saw that this may be attested to or this may be you know um, call, uh, this may be uh, proven by re by referring to for instance let us let us look at this slide the demographic distribution of the English language. Then second the native and non native users across cultures okay, the number of people who speak English across different cultures whether native or otherwise. Point number 3, we also saw the importance uh, of the increasing importance of English in world forums, right? Uh, whether it be uh, important um, governmental uh, inter you know international governmental meetings or whether it be in conferences and seminars as you have seen or will be seeing in future, uh, English is used as the medium of communication, information and exchange of knowledge and views in these important world fora. And last but not the least English has a very rich literary tradition. Okay. So, as we saw these in the last lecture, these are some of the markers of the power of English. These are some of you know the testimonies regarding the power of English. Next we saw, let us look at this slide. Um, there is also of course, apart from the magic of English, there is also the use uh, you know the, the use of English almost to the point of um, you know uh, to the point of manipulation. For instance, we saw that English is a medium of power, it is a tool of power which can easily be a tool of manipulation. Second, it is a tool of control, it is definitely uh, manipulable as far as it is a tool of authority and it is also a tool of cohesion. Now, how you may be wondering how is cohesion a matter of manipulation. Okay. Sometimes it may happen that uh, the cohesion that you see or you know the sort of togetherness that you see right whether in, in as far as language is concerned or whether as far as politics is concerned may really be a matter of uh, you know the working of a dominant ideology. Okay. We see these kind of you know uh, com uh, commentary on this kind of work done in 
uh, disciplines as like cultural studies for instance. Okay. So, cohesion is also you know at times a matter of manipulation at times a matter of coercion or say manufactured, manufactured consent. Okay. So, English is not it is not simply a matter of demographic uh, distribution or a matter of you know use uh, as a lingua franca in international fora, English is also can also be a tool of manipulation. This is what we saw in the last lecture. Then we also saw an important formulation for which Professor Braj Kachuri is uh, well known today and we saw the circles, okay, the circles of English as far as its globalized spread is concerned. And Professor Kachuri as we saw in the last lecture talks about three circles, the first being the inner circle. Um, comprising the United Kingdom, Ireland, the United States, New Zealand, South Africa and Canada where English is used as in parts of Canada of course, where English is used as you know or in a native uh, speaker sense. Then we saw the outer circle. The outer circle we saw referred to countries like India, Pakistan and the Philippines for instance these are countries where English has had a historical importance. For example, the erstwhile colonies of the British Empire. And finally, the expanding circle, okay. In the expanding circle we saw where is where you know the expanding um, use and influence of the English language. Uh, for instance, in countries like China, Russia, Japan, Europe and Egypt. Um, I would like to end with one or two points and as far as this recap is concerned okay, because these are immensely important and it helps us to you know, uh, you know to, to relook take, uh, take another look at you know um, uh, the, the point of attitudinal neutrality. Let us look at this slide. Okay. The point of attitudinal neutrality for instance, um, where we found that English again its alchemical power is one in which it may you know contribute to several social uh, sociological factors. For instance, we saw code mixing in English to neutralize identities okay, as we saw in the last lecture in native languages or dialects identities uh, social stratification may, you know certificatory measures that may be uh, that, that may be divisive in nature that may be even exploitative in nature for caste for instance okay, in India. So, they uh, English helps as a neutralizing linguistic strategy. Let us look at this slide here, neutralization as a linguistic strategy and its uses and it provides an additional code with or without mixing that has referential meaning with cultural connotations and such use of English results in the developing of new code mix varieties of language. This is extremely important okay, the attitudinal neutrality and power of the English language. Then let me end this recap with a reference again to Braj Kachru's words and I am quoting directly from uh, you know the alchemy of English. Kachru says the alchemy of English is this, okay. the alchemy of English present and future then does not only provide social status, it also gives access to attitudinally and material, this a materially desirable um, domains of power and knowledge. It provides a powerful linguistic tool for manipulation and control. In addition, says Kachru again, this alchemy of English has left a deep mark on the languages and literature of the non-Western world. English has thus caused transmutation of languages equipping them in the process of new societal, scientific and technological demands. Okay. So, this is uh, a brief recap of our last lecture on the alchemy of English and on the power of English and as also the manipulative um, you know, uh, potential of the English language. Well, the lecture uh, or the topic of today's lecture is related to the last lecture and our lecture today is entitled uh, the globalization of English and uh, let us see what we have uh, in store today. Um, well, there are definitely so many ways in which you can talk about English as a global language. Okay? You can talk about um, how English 
uh, historically became a globalized language. Okay, you can talk about the extent of the global spread of English. You can talk about also the politics, okay, inherent in uh, the globalization of any language for that matter. Okay, so there's definitely so much to be spoken, uh, you know, um, about as far as globalization and English are concerned. Uh, in within um, the constraints of a single lecture, I am um, well aware that it is not possible for me or for us to discuss several aspects of this. Nevertheless, this being uh, our course being an introductory course, okay, I will touch upon uh, a few uh, you know points and as always I shall be referring to work done in this uh, you know uh, in this uh, context by a few scholars both you know uh, both contemporary scholars and scholars who have also in the past contributed a lot uh, in, the, in this respect. So, gl the globalization of English is what we talk about uh, and for that uh, I uh, refer to two, um, two books right and um, you as mentioned in one of the earlier lectures as you know David Crystal is one of the most important scholars as far as the English studying the English language is concerned right. So, his book English as a global language this is a book which is definitely very important for those of you who are you know who want to work on uh, this aspect of English as a global language or the globalization of English. The second book that I uh, have um, referred to is by Tom MacArthur and it is uh, entitled The English Languages right published uh, by Cambridge University Press. So, these are the two books that from which I shall be largely drawing this lecture. You are of course, free to refer to several other books um, you know dealing with the same topic with the same area and um, the first I would like to begin uh, with a quotation and this is by Edmund Weiner. And uh, this quotation is, um, you know, it, it's taken from MacArthur's book, okay, Tom MacArthur's The English Languages. Referring to this tendency, okay, um, or the historical fact of the development of English as a global language, this is what Edmund Weiner has to say, and I'm quoting from him. The English vocabulary is now federated rather than, than centralized. Look at the, the, the import of what he is saying. Okay. It is now is drawing this analogy or metaphor from uh, political systems, right? And he says that rather than especially when you talk about the English uh, vocabulary or English words, okay, uh, the Eng English vocabulary is no longer centralized, the English vocabulary is federated, right. No one person's English is all English, but each English speaker is to some extent multilingual within English. So, very early on now in our in our discussion on the globalization of English, we have come across a scholar who points to Englishes, okay, who points to the fact that the older uh, ideology if you may or the older ways of talking about uh, standard English, talking about received pronunciation, all these are now revised and it is the spread of uh, you know the English language, it is uh, you know the, the availability okay, the growing vocabulary and the growing acceptability of English vocabulary uh, for which he uses the word federated rather than centralized is something which is a reality that we have to accept today. Okay. So, there is a definite shift, right? there is a definite shift from an older ideology of an English which is what we say the Queen's English or is an English which is British English. right? Um, speakers all over the world who have anything to do with English really. Okay, in whatever degree are uh, have appropriated English and they are as is mentioned by Weiner here, the each English speaker let us look at this again, each English speaker is to some extent multilingual within English. Okay, so, we shall be looking uh, we saw part of this in the last lecture and we, we will also understand this more as we go on to talk about the different aspects of the globalization of English. Well, 
So, if we ask this question, right, let us look at the slide here, please. Uh, what is the scope, right? What is the scope of talking about the globalization of English? In the sense that, what are the different ways in which we may talk about English as a global language? I am aware of the fact that English as a global language and the globalization of English okay, are not the same thing, but for the purpose of this lecture, I am really completing the two. We are talking about when we talk about the different aspects through which we can approach or the different ways in which we can speak about the scope of um, you know the globalization of English, uh, we may zoom in on these. For instance, this is no these are these are not the only uh, of, you know uh, aspects of the scope of such a study. But however, okay, for our elementary level, we can talk definitely about the power of English, increasing power of English. We can refer to the history, okay, of the spread of English. We can talk about culture and the English language. We can obviously talk about the politics of the globalization of English. We can talk about the advantages of the spread of English or the global reach of English. We can talk about the risks in involved in it as well as the diverse ways in which this global, uh, you know, this uh, global reach of English uh, has taken different shapes, right. So, power, history, culture, politics, the advantages as well um, as the risks of you know uh, the globalization of English is the scope is part of the scope of studying um, you know uh, the global reach of this language. Well, I'd referred to David Crystal uh, a while ago, and I'd said that he is one of uh, you know the most important scholars as far as the English language is concerned. Some aspects of the study of the English language um, are concerned, and Crystal in his book, right, uh, about English as a global language. He talks about the importance of a particular decade, okay. the 90s according to David Crystal are um, very important as far as the uh, you know this the, the global reach of English uh, is concerned. Right? So, in his book Crystal says that or you know he says why are the uh, 1990s very important as far as globalization uh, or the globalization of English is concerned and he points to among other things four factors. Okay. One a very important factor which is not just um, a matter of information and communication technologies which is also a sociological, cultural and linguistic matter for us okay, is the fact that the internet has given us new linguistic varieties. Okay. Uh, you will find uh, we know that the internet is you know uh, by its preponderance celebrated as a democratic medium, celebrated as one that you know uh, in which one can voice one's uh, you know one's ideologies in which different uh, ethnic cultures uh, you know are showcased different uh, different debates are you know given adequate space right in the same way even language wise we find that there are new linguistic varieties even that means there are new Englishes now you know okay there are new Englishes English in the plural Englishes as far as the internet uh, has concerned is concerned the internet has enabled right has enabled these new English varieties to be uh, to be seen and to be used by everyone. Okay. Then second the 90 is also important for another reason and which is the increasing endanger in the, you know, the endangerment of languages. Okay. The, uh, the remember we, we said that the scope of studying English studying English as a globalized language okay, the also entails the risks right we we'll talk about risks again a, a while later also entails the risks um, uh, involved in such a spread of such a language. Okay. So, the second is the uh, growing endangerment of languages and third let us look at this slide here the global position of English right 90s in the 1990s he um, this is what the statistics tell us in the 1990s okay, there was increasing public recognition of the English language and there was you know English uh, uh, seemed to have achieved what is called a global position. 
right the use of english had by the, by the 1990s given a definite um, you know uh, establishment to its use as a global um, language as uh, attaining a global position okay then uh, fourth was the redrawing of social linguistic frameworks right the revision of theories right the uh, you know on the rearticulation the new uh, areas that came up in the study of sociolinguistics because of the increasing uh, if you will the global march of english okay so what uh, do we have here as far as david uh, crystal's formulations are concerned let's quickly look at the slide again um, he points to on the one hand new linguistic new varieties available being available in the internet okay new english is also being available in the internet he talks about the global position in of english being established around the 1990s perhaps without any doubt he also uh, talks about the new socio linguistic frameworks that were coming up okay the revision of all the theories and finally on the other hand he says that there was also the recognition perhaps of the fact that many languages were now being endangered therefore when you talk about on the one hand right um, you know english being a global language english being as we saw in the last lecture in english having a certain english having a certain alchemy a certain magical quality in the sense that not not simply in the sense that it uh, you know it is um, a common medium of communication a, com a lingua franca so to speak we also saw in the last lecture how english could also um, help neutralize remember help neutralize certain uh, help neutralize uh, uh, certain uh, culture specific okay exploitative system for instance um, uh, certain words in nat uh, you know in vernacular languages uh, in in a uh, in a country for instance ours where there are different words for the same thing to be used by different castes okay on the other hand um, scholars have pointed to and i am trying to make this lecture a sort of a balanced one okay not simply this is not a celebration of uh, you know the global purported global march of english okay we are trying to look at it from two different aspects one is the positive aspects of you know the growth of english as a global language and also you know uh, uh, the, f the the fallout or other you know the the disadvantages or risks as um, we put it okay of having a language uh, overtaking other languages right so uh, from the other aspect really let's look at global english as you know these are some of the points given by critics this is a for instance the loss of linguistic diversity okay obviously it's quite commonsensical it's quite rational for us to assume that the more one language you know uh, uh, one uh, one language um, is being used increasingly by uh, several parts of the world there is and other languages are used less right other languages um, you know fewer languages are sort of uh, being used in for instance international fora for instance okay um, then there is a loss of linguistic diversity and there are many uh, many scholars who also point uh, you know to the analogy between ecological diversity and uh, linguistic diversity many would even go on to say that there are as many uh, as many um, perceptions of reality okay as there are languages for instance um, there we have um, we have this theory by uh, two linguists uh, benjamin horf and edward sapir right which is known as the sapir horf um, hypothesis let me quickly write this here sorry me quickly write down the names so that you're acquainted with it the sapir horf hypothesis Okay, and similar, uh, you know, similar theories which if, which go on to propose that the language you speak determines your, uh, you know, the language you speak determines your view of the world. The language you speak determines your perceptions. Okay, so some linguists would go on to argue that 
the loss of a language is not just a loss of a wor of words it's not just a loss of a particular syntax not just a loss of phonology okay it is also the loss of perception the loss of you know another so to speak window to the world right so loss of linguistic diversity is one important point as far as you know the risks of global english are concerned next a similar point put in a different way is there is an acute homogenization okay homogenization of languages would also lead to homogenization of world views homogenization of or a narrowing of worlds of perception windows to perception okay which again uh, is not just a matter of losing a certain way of looking at the world it, it is a, a much larger you know aspect of of um, uh, losing ways of thinking losing ways of cognition the point that we shall come to a little later there is also because of the it's not just not just english okay because of any sort of globalization you can also related to the larger cultural sphere in the sense of globalization as ways of life why, why just the language ways of life of economic systems right of beliefs of values of even the emotions that we may have as some cultural critics argue right so there is also cultural saturation next there is cognitive loss now the point of cognitive loss is related to our you know the, uh, the point that we made about perception okay so there is cognitive loss is a different loss of different ways of cognizing the world okay different uh, different uh, sort of procedures so to speak okay which may uh, which uh, as some critics say interface in very important ways with language okay so it seems the more the languages in the world the more you know um, different kinds of cognitive of cognizing the world and the re uh, and reality so to speak okay of course the other point as we uh, let's see here in this slide is of course the increasing as we've discussed the increasing endangerment of um, uh, languages there are more and more endangered languages languages are dying at an alarming rate right and as crystal had mentioned okay in the 1990s uh, you know uh, this this uh, phenomenon was uh, registered uh, where you know uh, registered very strongly and which was the dying the death of several languages of the world okay and uh, there are many there are books which are going to really tell you you know how many languages die per per uh, per day or per week for instance okay in our world and finally of course the most uh, one of the most important points is that let's look at this slide here of power and politics okay uh, those who have English as their language in many ways also have power, also have not just you know political power, but cultural power, linguistic power, academic power. Okay? So, as we say uh, you know as I mentioned a while ago, we are, we are not when we look at you know the English as a global language or the globalization of English, we are also to take these uh, other uh, you know factors equally seriously instead of going on a celebration of a language. Now, let me um, bring to your uh, notice another quotation which I find very interesting which is by um, the scholar Selma Sontag. Okay? As you know from time to time we bring in the words of different scholars not just what they have you know not just the ideas or concepts they may give us or the theories they may give us you know i've always believed that one of the great um, rewards of reading uh, reading these scholars is not just you know uh, not just knowing otherwise we can simply have bullet points you know to 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 know uh, you know uh, point wise as we we do you know in some of our classes uh, the point is how they articulate how they articulate for instance we saw Edmund Weiner's you know very important interesting words like the feder you know English vocabulary is getting federated and not centralized. Okay? So, there are different ways very beautiful ways in which scholars have articulated uh, their points and uh, in that way let us look at Selma Sontag's words. The real world political conflicts about language mat matter to parents making choices about children's education. Now, this relates to the fact that having um, a language, whether it's English or Chinese, um, or Mandarin Chinese, or you know, or what have you, right? Uh, the fact is, 
uh, the real world as she says conflicts about language they matter to to different people for different reasons and they are really these are really important these are real issues to do with language and language choice right so i'm reading again the real world political conflicts about language matter to parents making choices about their children's education and as you know uh, in our country in in, in india it is really an, an important you know it's an it's an important um, uh, decision one takes in one's life uh, you know as regards uh, whether to chair to to send one's uh, children to um, you know a uh, uh, vernacular medium or uh, school with uh, you know vernacular medium of instruction or do we send uh, our children to uh, an english medium school okay so these are important real life matters second it also also making choices people making choices about the children's education to voters casting their ballots to people struggling to make a living while maintaining a meaningful and dignified life and to political officials making policies in democratic polities why i really i've brought this quotation to you is to show the you know the width you know to show the scope of you know how you know uh, to the score to the extent to show you the extent to which uh, appropriating a language okay a language okay in english for in this case okay um impacts so many different areas of our life from our children's education to to you know matters to making political choices to making electoral choices okay to people as she says here people struggling to make uh, to make uh, a living while maintaining a dignified life to political officials making policies and i read on their analysis can contribute to our understanding of politics culture and globalization so the analysis again made by you know cultural critics made by linguists as far as language is concerned conflicts about language uh our concern uh is something that can enrich our understanding of both language and of our cultural systems okay so we have seen that there are you know we've come across the word we came across this word somewhere even in in our education okay not just in this course of standard english it was especially in our time you know standard english was very important right there are certain standards of vocabulary standards of um of um uh, received pronunciation standards of ways of speaking of intonation etc okay so today we talk about not a standard english but we talk about standard englishes okay for now let's see how this has changed for instance in the 19th century uh, we can safely say that the standard english was the english of the united kingdom and its colonies okay and we called it the king's english or the queen's english in the early 20th century okay the united states of of america the us english was was gaining importance as us be, uh, us became a world power one of the most important political powers in the world uh, there was um, you know uh, in, intense migration of of students of people into uh, uh, the united states of america uh, and um so much of the benchmarks okay, okay in engineering and technology and also in the humanities and social sciences were coming from the united states of america so the standard english that was there in the 19th century uh, seemed to change and to be the english that was used in the us in the 20th and you know in the in 20th and 21st centuries also apart from the united states of america we have uh, you know um, englishes standard englishes coming up also from uh, australia from countries like canada from new zealand and south africa and today we have english the standard you know uh, the Eng uh, uh, english in india being another standard you know quote and quote standard so to speak okay as we shall see later on in one of our uh, lectures on um, you know english in india and in uh, countries like nigeria for instance okay so the you see the very idea also of a standard english is no longer i'll say we don't say english really we say english is also for standard english we do not say standard english today we say standard english is also from a historical point of view now uh this 
again uh, has happened. We'll take the example of the United States of America, for instance. Okay, uh, why why this um, development of a standard English that was based on the U.S. system uh, came about? Right. For instance, the increasing importance of the U.S. Let's look at this slide here. The U.S. educational system. Right. The uh, U.S. educational system. This includes not just uh, education in the graduate and you know the undergraduate and, and the graduate levels. Also includes uh, research done. It includes the way uh, the kind of English used in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, what was acceptable and not. It, it, it refers to as you saw see here the publishing industry, right? The kind of dictionaries, for instance, Webster's dictionaries. All of us are uh, familiar with dictionaries and grammars that were being written, which were different from the so-called 19th century standard English. Okay, manuals of usage, and as far as the media are concerned, the broadcasting norms, right? These helped. Um, we are looking, looking here at the example of uh, the United States of America. So, this helped in sort of establishing a different standard English, which was the English that was coming uh, from the United States of America, which was being consumed by us, which was uh, you know um, quickly, which had quickly set itself up as the English that is going to be. Even today, for instance, uh, many scholars wonder whether to use American English or British English as uh, you know institutes for instance okay institutions declare what kind of English they are using are they using the British English or the uh, American English right so as we see the global uh, the globalization of English is therefore not simply uh, a matter of English being and it's very simplistic to say that it's a matter of English being used. Okay, used uh, by that globalization means in, in English being used by different parts, people in different parts of the world increasingly being used, right. Uh, it is also a matter of different standards of English growing up, right. So, this really is a uh, you realize by now hopefully that it is very you know a very interesting way of looking and the you know the scope of this area about the global reach of English is something that is. Uh, uh, in the different aspects that are being added to it uh, you know over time by scholars. Now, um, David Crystal in his book on uh, you know um, uh, on English uh, and its global reach or English as a global language in page 4, he also talks about the official language status okay, for uh, a language to be really accepted right uh, and language to have a certain standard. Uh, Certain kind of language to have, uh, you know, a certain standard would require its, you know, a certain official language status to be used by government law. We saw this in the previous slide, media education, and also very importantly, something that we should be talking about when we talk about international English is foreign language teaching. Right? There has to be uh, not just the use of a particular language, or in this case, English as an official language, but uh, to be used by um, in the wings of government, law, media, etcetera, but also you know uh, in another in a country where English is not the native language is the teaching of English as a foreign language, right. It, this is also a marker so to speak of uh, the reach of English in that particular country. Okay? The reasons now why should um, you know uh, a country right choose a, a foreign language or uh, this is what the question that crystal david crystal um, raises is why should a country that is not the natives where, where the natives are not speakers of english why should uh, that global reach okay be sort of you know be sort of accepted or sort of allowed in a country and he says that there are different reasons for the global reach of english uh, not the least of which is a let's look at this slide a historical tradition Maybe colonization, okay? Uh, maybe trade, if not direct colonization. Uh, the historical tradition uh, is something that we have to look into. No, you know, we just we don't just look at only the current status of the use of a certain language. Okay, the current statistics. It is important for us to go back to history and to see how historical traditions, historical facts, events and historical ideologies have enabled you know the spread uh, of the English language uh, and has enabled it to come to a status 
okay, in which it is today. Okay. So, first is what the uh, uh, invoking a historical tradition and trying to draw the trajectory of the global sort of reach of that language okay, from a historical perspective. Second is also its political feasibility, definitely if there is if it is not if a language is not feasible right politically, then it is not uh, you know, uh, it is not uh, appro appropriated okay, by a certain region. Okay. So, historical tradition, political feasibility and also of course, contact commercial, cultural and technological both historically. It is not that only historically right, that, that language should have kind of reached us, but also in the current uh, uh, scenario uh, matters technological, matters commercial and cultural. Right. These are what keeps a language which is not which was not native to a certain uh, country or region and which makes it uh, you know have a tremendous impact on the populace on the people of that region where even as we saw matters of power of prestige okay, of even success in life and also of social sociological changes okay, are enabled by that particular language. This uh, may also be put in. If you look at this slide, we can we can put it in another way. The points come from David David Crystal, but we can have a different map of this. For instance, Crystal says that multilinguism, right, um, is a world resource. Now, this is one of the reasons why we do celebrate, okay, uh, the global reaches of language and why. Some scholars say that uh, you know to have one um, you know say to have one language uh, which has sort of determined uh, for 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 several hundreds of years, if you may, okay, as uh, as the language or the only language of a region or a country. Uh, may lead to a certain narrowness as we saw of perception of, of perspective of cognition. Okay. So, multilingualism is then a world resource. Okay. The more languages we know, the more languages we have in you know in the repertoire of languages of the world, this becomes a resource again not just for a, a particular region or a country, it becomes a resource also you know for the whole world right then multilingualism as a world resource leading to linguist, a linguistic heritage and also diverse cultures and perspectives okay you see in this slide and we have an we get an understanding of the cognitive functioning of the human mind as far as language interfaces with such cognitive propensities now let's read from crystal and this uh, again is very telling it talks about language and power you know the power of a language as a global language right why a language says crystal why a language becomes a global language has little to do with the number of people who speak it okay so english may not be uh, you know demographically speaking may not be uh, the language that has the maximum number of speakers in this world as we had already referred to this earlier. Okay. So, it's, it need not be the case that English is, uh, uh, is, 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 a, is not the most spoken or spoken by most language spoken by most people in the world. He says why a language, let us read this again, why a language becomes a global language has little to do with the number of people who speak it. It is much more to do with who those speakers are, it is very important. Okay. And uh, the global reach of English in that sense, you know, you, you may say that why aren't we talking about the global reach of Mandarin Chinese for instance, okay. then you Crystal would give this answer, he says it is not important how many speak, how many people are speaking that language, you are not going by a head count, right. what is important is who are the people, right? who are the people who are using this language. So, it is much more to do with who those speakers are. There is the closest of links between language dominance and economic, technological and cultural power. Okay. So, I think a, more, a very important point here that is um, raised by Crystal is you know um, not as I said not the number of people who speak English, okay. talking about the globalization of English also 
in relation to to the whole phenomenon of globalization. Okay. The phenomenon of globalization is a first importantly a uh, matter of economics, a matter of finance, a matter of resources, a matter of market. Right. Second and if not uh, less uh, you know I, 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 if not more or uh, you know important for us is cultural globalization the the you know uh, where language is uh, included okay is about about ways of life it is about values okay it is about as I said even, even emotions it is about arrangements social arrangements it is about the books we read it is about the ideas that we hold and in that sense okay he is talking about the globalization of language now of English do you understand this okay so English as a globalized language is not about the reach of English and the number of people who speak English it is the it is the question is really rephrased as uh, uh, which language is spoken by the most powerful uh, nations or people in the world now whether we like it or not this seems to be a reality okay uh, the need for such you know globalized you know a globalized language is also to do with uh, certain you know say uh, uh, certain um, not benefits really it's to do with certain convenience okay so with a certain convenience that has to do with two mainly two kinds of worlds which is the academic world and the world of commerce okay this is also a point mentioned not simply by david crystal by several other scholars is that you know imagine a world uh, in where uh, there are different academic activities going on in several parts of um, our planet and we are unable to share that academic knowledge we are unable especially i would say you know uh, especially scientific knowledge we are unable to share that knowledge because our languages are different okay and on the other hand also okay and that is uh, um, also the other aspect is of commerce right uh, a commercial transaction uh, commercial relationships are not possible okay if one doesn't have a language which is a language uh, used as far as you know commerce is concerned okay so this is another i think the the a commercial aspect of it is highlighted by many people, but really the the importance again of having a global you know global language as far as academics is concerned is uh, has not really uh, is not really spoken about at least uh, you know in, in in general conversation. Okay, a lot of work has been done on uh, by by linguists in this area. Okay, so academic. Um, um, exchange, commercial exchange. These are the two broad areas under which you know uh, there are benefits of having uh, you know um, uh, uh, of having knowledge of a language like English, right? Then again, let's see what um, uh, Crystal has to say here, right? And he, in fact, we can use a term here. They're not his was really the for uh, you know this the global imperative. It almost seems like when he two minutes talk about this so we are talking about a global imperative so, so to speak then that there has to be there is an imperative for a global language and there crystal says here there has never been a time when so many nations were needing to talk to each other so much okay and remember he talks about the 1990s onwards when this seems to become almost an imperative there has never been a time let us read that again when so uh, so many sorry here so I am very sorry so many people wish to travel to so many places there has never been such a strain placed on the conventional resources of translating and interpreting never has the need for more widespread bilingualism been greater to ease the burden placed on the professional few and never has been there has, uh, has there been a more urgent need says here quite categorically there never has there been a more urgent need for a global language. Okay. So, they almost as I said there seems to be an imperative to have a global uh, language particularly we look at the speed at which the intensity at which you know all these different things whether it is translation or whether it is you know uh, you know nations conversing with one another whether it is tourism do you understand there is bilingualism so many things factors come together in fact to propel so to speak a language as um, a, a language with a global reach. 
So, the risks then finally will end with risk and the risks again are pointed to by uh, crystal the risks here again uh, among those uh, you know over and above those we saw here are monolingual elitism whenever there is one language is always for instance Sanskrit in India could have led to a sort of you know uh, um, a sort of very uh, a dangerous sort of you know um, a Brahminical elitism here where others are excluded because they cannot speak so called pure language. Then there is a cognitive edge for na native users compared to other users a new class is formed right. Uh, then there is uh, manipulation and triumphalism language death, death of other languages apart from uh, other than English or extinction and reduce opportunities for those who do not know English. Okay. So, there is again as I said there are risks involved right uh, mere triumphalism is not going to work here. Okay. So, there is a balance should be a balance in looking at English as a global language. So, we now come to the questions and just a couple of questions really with which we shall end this um, um, this discussion on the globalization of English. And uh, if you ask a question like delineate the scope of studying English as a global language that is in what how many different ways can you study English as a global language. And we know that the answer is this that we can study the, you know English as a global language from the point of view of power, history, culture, politics, the advantages of having a global language and the risks therein also and also regard to the diversity of English that is Englishes, the different Englishes including as we saw different standard Englishes. Then why were the 1990s now this comes from David Crystal crucial for the consolidation of English as a global language and he says the answer is that there was in the 1990s a realization of uh, you know the, uh, the importance of English as uh, an uh, you know as a global language um, surprisingly with the new varieties linguistic varieties coming up in the internet the global position of English its public recognition the redrawing of social linguistic frameworks in academics and the uh, you know uh, the importance of understanding endangered languages this also gives us you know two different aspects right of uh, one is uh, you know uh, the aspect of understanding the advantages of English and the other of understanding the disadvantages of having English or any other language again for that matter as a global language. Then what are the minimum requirements for a language to be a global one? The minimum requirements given by Crystal is that it has to have official status, it has to be used by different wings of government, law, okay. Uh, media and uh, definitely education also importantly there has to be foreign language teaching okay, of that language. right? Then finally, we end with this what are the risks of having language and as I said for the matter any other language as a world language as a global language is that it may lead to elitism where only those who speak English uh, and form an elite as you say here a new class. Right. Then there is a cognitive edge for native users of English. There is also a triumphalist, uh, the danger of uh, uh, a simplistic triumphalism of manipulation. There is definitely the danger of language death and extinction of languages and reduce opportunities, right, for those who do not, uh, you know, who, who do not have access to the global language. Okay. So, as I said in the beginning, there are so many ways um, of you know you can even have a whole course on English as a global language or the globalization of English. I said in the beginning that I am conflating the two the globalization of English or the, the English language and English as a global language. Okay, we can have obviously these two do not mean exactly the same things, but for the purpose of this lecture I may have sometimes used one for the other, but essentially this talks about you know the spread of English and you know the, it, the two things is the consequences one which is uh, which talks about the good aspects of it and the other is the risks of having a uh, language of uh, here in this case English as a globalized language. Thank you very much, we shall meet in the next class.